Hello and welcome to another update. In this one, I'll be covering the whole front line and with extra focus on Bahmut as always. So starting out, we'll be talking about this uh, incident here where the Ukrainian forces used some boats to cross the Dnieper River and are now on this uh, southern area of the Dnieper River. These Ukrainian units are in small numbers and with their small arms, which means that they are either infiltration troops or, as the Russian Ministry of Defense claims, uh, selfie troops, where they just go over for a PR stunt and then go back again. It's hard to tell. Uh, we'll see soon if there's going to be any sabotage in this area. Other than that, uh, this is not very significant. Then we look at the Donetsk front, where the Russian forces continue their attacks on the whole front line, all the way from the north of Evdeivka to the Uledar area. As for the northern area around Kremina, there's actually been some territorial changes. If we look at the recap map, so I decided to color code it a bit so that it is more clear uh, when st things happened. So uh, the Russian forces actually managed to recapture parts of this area. I haven't put it in the recap map because uh, and I expected to change exchange hands a bit more, but they managed to recapture the intersection and push a bit to the west. Then we see here by Bilorivka, the Russian forces actually managed to nine days ago uh, recapture parts of the southeast of Bilorivka, reaching this uh, coal mine, I believe it is, or uh, whatever mine this is. Uh, it's a high rise area for the uh, south of Bilorivka. If the Russian forces manage to capture this, they will have fire control over whole of Bilorivka. They also managed to capture parts of these eastern parts of Bilorivka. Then we see uh, here by Spirne, the Russian forces also managed to capture this uh, station here. Uh, I believe it is a gas station or something similar, where it's some industrial complex to the east of Spirne. And then finally here, west of Chernobyl the Ukrainians recently, about a week ago, captured the parts of these forest patches here to the west of Chernobyl and now the Russian forces managed to recapture it uh, yesterday. That is all. Other than that, there's been fighting all the way from Mekivka down to Spirne on the whole front line. Then I want to read out this statement by Prigozhin, as I believe it has a huge impact on how the fighting will take place uh, here moving on out into the future. No more prisoners in Bakhmut, the head of Wagner PMC Prigozhin. Prigozhin's comments on the audio surveillance of the conversation of the UAF fighters, Ukrainian Armed Forces, where they decided to shoot the wounded soldier of the PMC Wagner and not capture anyone. Of course, I heard this wiretapping long before it hit the media. I can say one thing, that this wiretapping about the shooting of our wounded prisoners by Ukrainians has a very serious humanitarian significance and we will never break international laws, humanism, which they of course have, but whether or not it is institutionalized is another question. And the law of humanism begins the moment you capture a person. Capture them, start caring for them, treat them, don't hurt them, and after some time, give them home. By exchange, or as you like, we gave some times and just like that. That's why we will not break the rules of humanism and we will destroy everyone on the battlefield. That's why this law is called the law of the 300th. We still don't know the name from our man who is wounded. Ukrainian villains were shot. And we will kill everyone who is on the battlefield. We will not take another prisoner. So here he says essentially that there will be no more prisoners in uh, Bakhmut. He claims that the POW law, Geneva Convention, only covers for the ones who are captured. So if he doesn't capture anyone, he doesn't have to uh, keep them safe and so on. So he will just kill them on sight and not capture anyone. That is the new policy of Wagner and Bermud. So this is very significant because this means that there is, it will it'll be a lot bloodier. There will be a lot more casualties on both sides because as soon as one side stops taking prisoners, both sides will stop and everyone will just get killed. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe. It helps me out a lot. Then we go to the Bakhmut front, 
where here the Russian forces are continuing their attacks on the whole front line. They continue their attacks by E40 highway, south of Odehova Vasilivka, south of Ivanivska, in the, di the, in the direction of Ivanivska, by the 00506 uh, road, by the trench networks and so on, trying to move across it, trying to gain full control over it. Uh, to the north of Homove, as well as in the city itself. So in the city, there's been two territorial changes since my last update. The uh, Russian forces have reached the garage area here to the southeast of the industrial faculty in Bakhmut, and they're now fighting within it, as well as the garage area. Then we also see a Russian advance here to the west of the railway area, where they are closing in on the high-rise area, which is the main fortification of the Ukrainian forces within the city. So the current defensive position in the city is that the Ukrainians have four main points. They have the main high-rise area here in the center, which covers this area. Then they have the garage area, which covers this area here. Then they have the Olympic school, but I consider this to be smaller as it is very isolated. Then we have the industrial faculty here to the south, and we have the fortifications by the intersection here to the southwest. So the four main, I would consider these four, as these are the ones where the Ukrainian forces are mainly defending. While this one is heavily defended, yes, but it is so isolated that there is no point in considering it one of the main fortifications. So with this, we know that the Russian forces are currently focusing on four of these five areas. They are attacking the Olympic school here to the northwest. They are attacking the garage area from three directions. And they are attacking on the, the industrial faculty as well as in the southwestern fortified zone. So they have recently increased their attacks by also attacking from the Dacia area. So they are attacking in both of these directions to try to reach the road here to the southwest. And they're also trying to advance on the industrial faculty as that will allow the Russian forces to bypass the northern area and attack him from multiple directions. Then at the same time they're also focusing heavily on the garage area here to the north of the residential zone with the high-rise buildings and that is because the high-rise buildings area is the main defensive point of the Ukrainian forces. This means that the Russian forces wants to take control over all the other ones first before focusing on that with all of their forces. So the current situation is that the Russian forces are heavily bombarding this area specifically while they are storming every other area to gain control over them before focusing on the main one where they can encircle it and capture it from all sides. So the way it has been working so far is that the Ukrainian forces have been cooped up in heavily fortified areas as the Russian forces attempt to storm them and take control of them. So what has recently changed is that the Russian forces started using their glider bombs. That means that they have much heavier bombardment power when they attack areas. And that is very significant because one of these bombs can completely obliterate some of these high-rise buildings. If they hit two bombs on this building here from these two sides, it, the whole building comes falling down. So essentially what we see is that the Russian forces now have much heavier firepower, which allows them to destroy the Ukrainian positions and bury the Ukrainian soldiers in the rubble as the firepower is just that heavy compared to what they had before. So the heavily fortified areas are very useful, but they become much less useful once they get destroyed by the Russian bombs. So as long as the Russian forces continue improving their bombing power, then the defensive positions of the Ukrainian forces can, will continuously decrease, which allows them for faster and safer advance for the Russian forces. So the current situation is that the Russian forces will, will continuously advance in the residential areas, as well as the other fortified positions of the Ukrainian forces. As they continue advancing, the Russian forces will also simultaneously bombard the heavily fortified Ukrainian positions, which will allow them to uh, essentially cut off the Ukrainian forces, as well as weaken their fortifications, which allows them to completely take down the Ukrainian fortifications here to the west of Bakhmut. 
So, so far, the Ukrainian forces have not found any counterattacks, counteroperations, counter strategies to uh, defeat this uh, new strategy of the Russian forces, which is why we're seeing the Russian advances day by day here in Bakhmut. So it will be interesting to see exactly how they will develop uh, counter actions to, so that they are able to properly defend compared to the current situation. This is also it explains a lot why they are continuously asking for air defense uh, missiles as they currently are running very low according to the leaked documents they're running very low on their current air defense systems however the west is very slow at providing these air defense missiles to ukraine both ammunition as well as systems as uh, so far they've brought about four to ten systems uh, which are comparable to the S-300 or S-400 systems, which means that the Russian forces can continuously bombard with the current uh, rate of uh, weapon deliveries to Ukraine when it comes to air defense missiles. And even to the point where it is a continuous decline for the Ukrainian forces, which means that they have less and less air defense missiles as every day goes by. Then I have this final point, which is the fact that the current weather is terrible for everyone involved in this fighting. Uh, it is equally detrimental to both the Ukrainians and the Russians in some parts, and other parts it is beneficial to the Russians, and other parts it is beneficial to the Ukrainians. So here to the north by the road, it is equally detrimental to both sides. As we can see in this video here, this is the current conditions of the trenches here in Ukraine, as the weather is so rainy which makes it very muddy and very wet in the trenches specifically because all of the water drains into them and that causes the situation to be like this as for within the city the russian forces have the advantage here as they control about 90 percent of the city which means that they aren't as affected by the weather as the ukrainians are as they have to continuously provide supplies to the city which means that they have to go through these muddy roads while the Russian forces already have major stockpiles within the city on the eastern, northern and southern parts, which means they don't have to focus on the rain, they can just walk through the paved roads within the city. As for the south and the direction of Ivanivske, as the Russian forces are mostly using and deployed on the fields, which makes them very vulnerable to the weather, while the Ukrainian forces are deployed by Ivanivsky to Pushki and so on, which means that they aren't really that affected by the weather as the Russian forces are in this part of the front line. And that is all for this update. Thank you for watching and have a great day.